is the Good Girl Podcast. I am Cameo King, your host of the Good Girl Podcast, where we are redefining what it means to be good through uncomfortable truths. I call those uncomfortable truths confessions. So every week we have someone on with a confession. And this week, y'all, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, listen, I'm excited. It's, I think it's interesting because this is the Good Girl Podcast. And we have someone on with the name Good in their name. <laughs> and we're talking about something that is typically stigmatized. So I just think this is the, the best mashup in life. And so without further ado, I'm bringing in Goody Howard. Hey! Hey! <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing I, great. How are you? I, I'm, I'm doing good. And I, I'm, I'm excited about this conversation. I'm excited to be educated. I'm just, I'm excited to be corrected potentially in my thinking, but just to, you know, become free, I guess. Cause I think a lot of us are in bondage based on how we think about sex and whatever Absolutely. that word means to people. So I'm, 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 I'm excited to hear from you. So if you don't know already um, a little bit about Goody. So, when we were talking earlier, you said you don't like when people limit how they see you. So you are a sexologist and that's so much broader than a sex therapist. Mm -hmm. um, it is like this entire ethos of how we understand, interact and engage with sexology. So define you for us. Um, well, if I'm defining me, um, oh, that's... <laughs> That's, I, I think for me, I'm a, I'm, my husband says I'm a genius. Um, I love, I'm an intellectual, I'm a lifetime student. I learn things and I can apply soft skills across industry, across platform, across effort. And I think with sexuality and being a sexologist, Oscar Wilde has a quote that says everything in the world is about sex except sex. Sex is about power. Mm. And if you apply that, across the board, any social ills we have, any political challenges, all of the things that we are negatively impacted around are connected to the uh, expression, oppression, or repression of human sexuality. And I can connect those dots for people. It's not just about how to ride dick or a blowjob class or an orgasm workshop. It's also about sex positive parenting, how to be a responsive partner, it's also about uh, ending rape culture and challenging your own views around what is and is not appropriate. Um, I think that sexuality and sexology in general is a tool to shift the paradigm of this planet. Yeah. And if we acknowledge and accept comprehensive human sexuality as a component of a basic building block of education, then we're gonna change the trajectory of generations. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so even with you answering that question, for me, this somewhat shifts the questions that I had lined up um, for you. <laughs> it, it, listen, it, I'm like, I have to throw all them questions out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so one that comes to my mind often since, since you um, since this is what you do. So you're a genius and you're working, connecting everything we have come to know about our social economic status, how we exist. I think one thing that's huge for me as a black woman uh, being born and raised in America and being descendants, as with most of us are, of enslaved, of an enslaved people, how have you seen that show up? How does that affect how we interact and in ways that we that we just don't know, but we're just flowing in this? Who Listen, start, you don't even know how. Heavy. <laughs> Ooh, because the thing is, I believe in liberation for all black people and all black lives matter. Mm -hmm. And so that means everybody. I'm pro queen and pro ho. Right. And so black people, okay. black Americans have been socialized with so much white people shit. I'm sorry. We have been so colonized that we have internalized some of that, all of it, most of it. And we perpetuate it and project it onto each other. So even with, let's say, you know, gay people, LGBT trans folks and all of that, you will hear black people say, oh, that's white people shit. Right. You've heard. That. I'm sure you. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. In real life, this is why the beauty of human sexuality is so important, because you cannot be sex positive without being actively anti-racist and actively decolonizing your mind. Because everything we know to be sexuality in this country is rooted on research and paradigms and context from white people. 
The biology movement is what's changing this fucking planet. And so when we look at trans folks and gender nonconforming people and LGBTQIA folk, what people say, oh, that's white people shit. What actually happened, okay, is that on the continent, there were no genders. It wasn't just two genders. It wasn't just, it wasn't you were gay or you're straight. People just connected. If I like you and we get along, and we have sex, we just have sex. It wasn't two men having sex, two women having sex, a man and a woman. It was just, if I like you and we take it there and we fucking, we fucking. Women were kings, right? Gender expression was more vast. Pants didn't exist on the continent before the white people came. Okay, so what happened was when the colonizers got to the continent, when I say the continent, I mean the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. When when colonizers got to the continent and they see all these these gender expressions and all these sexualities, they can't you can't control what you can't understand. So they said, oh, no, no, here's a box and here's a box. Either you're a boy or you're a girl, either you're gay or you're straight, either you're a Christian or you're a savage. Get in these boxes. And we did. And now we carry those boxes. Those boxes came with us over here. And we have carried and we have carried those boxes like they are ours. Yeah, yeah. They're not ours. And what's happening now is a reconnection to indigenous ancestral plane for black people specifically. And in the reconnection to that energy and that divinity comes an awareness that is also connected to our sexuality, our gender expression and our orientation. I want to add, I want to, while you say it's awareness, I think it's also a fear for some people that mm -hmm. what they have been taught or what they have lived their life by and also what they have been privileged for folks who identify as heterosexual and also uh, demonize other folks who are not. Um, mm -hmm. It's a fear there that everything, how I live my life. It's all a know, lie. Yeah. yeah. It's, all, it's like when you find out you're in the matrix, the stake ain't real. Now yeah. the fucking stake ain't real. What do, you, what do you mean? What do you, do you mean? Go, is real? You don't know yeah. say you want to go take the other pill again. You don't want that awareness. Yeah. And that's yeah. very, very true. And also you have to look at the, you know, um, anti womanness of it all. And, you know, the there's nothing worse than being a woman. Like with gay men, feminine gay men are the most derided because they're close to womanhood. And it's not the worst than being a woman if you're a man. Right? Not considering the fact that we are black women specifically, we contain the Eve gene. Like y'all can't do shit without us. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the level of patriarchy, the level of misogyny, the level of colonization that exists with everything we've been taught and fed our entire lives. Yeah. Yeah. The process of sexuality and sexology allows you to in guessing your knee jerk reactions to certain things. And it just permeates into every into the rest of it. So, like, let's say you're a, a little girl when you're a little. I live in Texas. It's 108 degrees here, mm -hmm. you know. And mm -hmm. I, and you have a little girl, and she got shorts on and a little tank top because it's hot. Girl, go put some clothes on because you know, daddy finna have some men friends over. It's 108 degrees. Yeah. Are you trying to protect? What kind of men friends are y'all having over the house? Are you trying to sex? You're sexualizing this child. Why do we? And we feel like we're protecting her. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and and it's interesting, and I, I'm really thankful. I'm, I'm thankful that I have been put in certain spaces that has allowed me to accept some of these things and somewhat challenge. So I'm a classically trained dancer. And mm. so even in dance, you learn to desexualize some. I remember my dance teacher, she checked this. We was doing some hip movement. And she's like, why is y'all laughing? It's just your hips, you know? <laughs> like, check this real quick. Like, it's mm -hmm. the movement of your hips. And then even further than that, um, I was at some, it was some uh, Juneteenth celebration and it was a woman leading children and, and pretty much the entire, uh, you know, folks like they were on the grass or something and she was leading them in dance. And she made this comment and it has stuck with me. And she said, our children move their hips and allow them to move their hips because we carry a lot of stress in our hips. And that is just them oftentimes relieving the stress, just naturally doing what their bodies mm -hmm. do. So don't shame them for moving their hips. And even I think she connected it back to when, um, <clears throat> you know, we held, you know, uh, mm -hmm. cotton and things on our head. And again, having stress in their hips and we would move our hips to relieve some of the stress in our hips. But here we have, we've sexualized that and demonized that. And it even further back when we were on the continent, and water ain't accessible everywhere. You got to carry the water. Water bearers that give life to the whole, they whole village. It's a whole, just a group of people that go to the water and come back and forth before they even brought us the fuck over here. Yeah. It's, it's indigenous 
to our our DNA to be to have this freedom of body movement. No one moves like black people. No one just inherently. No one moves. No one walks like us. No one speaks with the cadences that we do. That is inherently in us. And that sway, that release of pressure is indigenous. And it has been indoctrinated out of us and colonized out of us. And I think that you're seeing people move back. The 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 diaspora and the universe, I really feel like is reaching back for us. Yeah. And it's like, come on, they, they're gathering us up because to be black in this country is to have all of the rhythm, but also have all of the blues. Yeah. We don't know where we from. We can't go back to Africa. We don't know where the fuck to go. You know what I'm saying? So like I think that there's a there's a there's a divine shift that's happening that's reaching back for us. And those of us that are receptive to it are more connected to liberation. Those yeah. of us that are not trying to gatekeep freedom or ask for freedom from other motherfuckers that don't look like us. And it, and it's and it's and it's so interesting because the reason the why I even started this conversation. So you talk about you know the gatekeepers, and oftentimes when I think about the gatekeepers, I think about uh, the old guard, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of our uh, grandfathers, some of our great grandfathers, who, um, and I think for the most part believe that they had the formula to survive and to exist in this world, in, in the Western society, mm -hmm. that we play by their rules, we do the best we possibly can by their rules, and we'll mm -hmm. get by, we'll be able to exist. So I, I think that that is a part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that they are also wanting to know and wanting to reconnect. And I say that because the reason I'm even having this conversation with you, Goody, is because my mom called me and she was like, I think you need to have a conversation about sex on, on the Good Girl podcast. I was like, what? I said, where did this come from? And she was like, I don't know. She was like, I just, she said she was just thinking about, and this will lead to my other question, but she was just thinking about how her mother, my grandmother, didn't really have a conversation about, with her about sex and how that affected her marriage, how that affected her expectations in her marriage, how things changed. And if it was like, was her mother supposed to have a conversation about sex with her? You know, just all these questions mm -hmm. she had. And mm -hmm. I think also her desiring to want to share some of those things with me and not yeah. having, you know, what she felt probably are the tools. To yeah, or share. the language. Yes. And I actually did, a um, my, me and a coworker, a colleague, Sky Banks, we did a uh, a workshop called Mama Said. And we talked about the narrative and the messaging passed down from black women to their daughters about sex and pleasure. And we don't have conversations like that. And like how she said, it changed the expectations of her marriage. We keep, we tell our our daughters, keep your dress tail down and your head held high, but we don't teach them how to navigate partnership. We don't teach them how to navigate romantic relationship. We definitely don't talk to them about sex. We don't tell them it's supposed to feel good. We don't tell them what, if it hurts, this may be you know, a concern. We don't talk about that. But then suddenly when they get partnered, they're supposed to suddenly know how to do it and how to keep a, keep a partner and all this other shit. And we're not preparing them for success. But also when you get into a relationship, when you don't have an expectation at all, or your only expectation has been created by media and you get in that shit and, you, and you're like, oh, this is nothing like what I thought because you didn't actually have that guidance. Because black parenting is control. Black parenting is not guidance, and sex positive parenting is guidance. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm like, come, come. Listen, I want to shoot and throw it at you. You I see what I'm saying? I, I do, and it, it shows up in so many ways. And, and again, how it's connected connected back to, and I feel like everything is connected back to slavery. You know, like why are we trying to control? Where where does that really, everything from when we, the, the idea of when we go in the store, don't touch nothing, don't like mm -hmm. all, all these things. But I understand what, what that's connected to because maybe 50 years ago, if I did touch something, it's a, it's a, it's a possibility that we mm -hmm. would literally die. Right. Yeah, shit, last week, it was a possibility. Like, and so what our grandparents, like, first of all, I'm very, very fortunate and blessed. All of my grandparents are still alive. Praise and God. seeing that and mm -hmm. hearing their stories and talking to them, I appreciate and respect what they built because they played the rules that applied for the time they were living in. Yes. Come. Those motherfucking rules don't apply now. Say, say it. And the longer we subscribe to the old rules, the longer that shit's going to perpetuate. Yeah. So we are the ones that are like, eh, 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 we're not doing that. Yeah. And I and so 
we're, we are the ones that are on the fence because we came from the old school and now are being introduct, indoctrinated into the new school, whereas we have the luxury of being old heads in the new school so we can kind of shape that. But my grandparents, my grandfathers were sharecroppers. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? My grandmother, when her mother passed away, all the kids went to the farm to work except her. She went to the orphanage because she was too little to work the farm. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And she's only like 80-something. Well, I don't know how she is because she started lying by her age a very long time ago. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they're all in the like 80s and 90s. And so mm-hmm. it's just that worked for the time and it was necessary yeah. at the time. You supposed to go to college and get an education and be educated to their standard because we have to be twice as good as them and blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. Now it's a yes and situation because we are the ones that are running the ship and we are saying, no, this is y'all standard. Y'all are discounting what we know as if, or and stealing our work and we're stepping out and being heard when we're being violated and when social violence is happening, not just interpersonal physical violence, but like social, emotional violence, professional violence, you know, discourteous and, and microaggressions and all of that shit. We are now on the uprise when our forefathers and grandparents would just take it and be pissed off. Yeah. We are we have the luxury of having luxury. existed in both spaces. Luxury. So one thing you said earlier, um, that our sexuality, you know, who we mm-hmm. are, and maybe not sexuality, so you may have to correct me on some of these terms, but how we come mm-hmm. to know about sex is essentially connected to everything in terms of who we are. Can you break that down a little bit or give us an example of what that um, means? Well, okay, so like let's say human sexuality, if if First and foremost, um, if you are are a child and your parents assume that you're straight, they make an assumption that you're straight because they're straight and they treat you as such, but you're not straight. Every way, everything you do is you're being mindful of how your parents are going to react, what your family's going to say. If, if they're going to be, if you're in a receiving household that's going to be receptive to this, or it's a household where you're in danger, or it's not a safe space for you, you're, you're going to suffer in school, you're going to suffer in your social development, you're going to suffer, you know, your emotional and mental health wellness is in jeopardy, like all of these different things, just because your parents assumed, they're talking to you like, so a reframe would be like, if you have a son, he'd be like, so you like little, any little, little girls in your class? They can honestly tell you no, if they like boys. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you think you, you know, you don't have to have a conversation with them about interpersonal relationships. It's, we, we, we boil it down just to the fucking not to the healthy, happy, balanced relationships that creates the perfect storm for the sex. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then so instead of saying, do you like any little girls in your class? You can say, well, is there anybody in your class you like? You know what I'm saying? I just didn't name a gender. I didn't assign a gender to it. Mm-hmm. And we think we have open open door policies with our kids. Well, just come to me if you need some condoms. And I get nobody wants to come to their parent about that. Nobody. Teach me how to use them, and then just make sure they're available to me. I have a bowl of condoms on the bar in my living room. Nobody. So, so what what do you think are the um, <clears throat> top three things we need to unlearn about sex? Um, I think the top three things we need to unlearn about sex is that sex is natural and healthy. Wait, some people, wait, wait, hold on. Um, people don't think it's natural and healthy? Well, they don't think it's natural and healthy for certain age groups or certain demographics. People don't think that people with disabilities are having sex. We desexualize people. Oh, because oh, I'm, I'm not like, fucking. who, how? That, like, that's why we all here. What, what? Well, okay. sex, it, sex, sex happens throughout the lifespan and exploration of sex and pleasure is, ha- is healthy throughout the lifespan. Okay. Babies start investigating their own genitals at potty training age because that's when they start realizing that those things do something, mm-hmm. right? So I think we need to we need to we need to destigmatize it that it's not a dirty bad word. Um, I think we need to make space for human variance, and when I say that, I don't use the words diversity and inclusion because that implies that we are other we are welcoming the other into our mainstream way of being. There are no absolutes in nature. A flower, two flowers on the same plant are going to be are, are not going to be the same color. They might be close, but they're not absolutely the same color. There are no absolutes in nature, and so human variance is human variance. Our our skin tone, our body types, our hair colors, our orientations, our gender, everything. And so we need to make space for human variance and understand that everybody's not straight, because that's not the default. And it's not everybody's, it's not nobody's business. We should get to a place. We don't worry. We don't care about what straight people are doing. 
Girl, did you hear she was straight? Girl, I know she's straight, ain't she? We don't do that. So we shouldn't be doing it about other people's orientations and who they who they're attracted to. And also, I think that we need to question everything. If you have a knee-jerk reaction to something, especially like if you see these memes and stuff like that, that knee-jerk reaction is your is your socialized response. Question that reaction. What did I get that from? Do I really feel that way? Because typically it's going to be your socialized reaction or your traditional reaction. And tradition is peer pressure from dead people. Peer pressure from dead people. The shit that was appropriate for them is not appropriate for us. And so you have to you have to stop and say, okay, do I really feel that way? Or is this just how I feel like I'm supposed to feel or how I've been taught to feel? Yeah. yeah. And that, that permeates every other part of your life. Once you start knee-jerk responding to that shit... You're like, why do I use this toothpaste? Do I use this toothpaste because this is what my mama bought and what my grandmama bought? Or do I buy it because I like it? And and this listen, and, and again, I, I, I really believe that I that I am privileged to have like be open because I know it's a process, right? To be open to mm-hmm. certain things. Um it's a lifelong but, process. It is. It, it's because maybe something you were taught or something that mainstream believes isn't true for you or your family, or it doesn't apply all. And mm-hmm. it's work or it's somewhat opposes. So you kind of have these two opposing truths. And so it, it opens up like, what, well, what else could be untrue or what else could Correct. not necessarily fit? And I think that's an event. And that's also where we can start. You know, so if you're mm-hmm. listening and you feel challenged, <laughs> yeah, right. this is where we this is where we start, because I'm, I'm pretty positive. There are some areas in your life that don't necessarily align with um what you've been told, uh, what mm-hmm. you've been taught, and how you how you exist, whatever it may be, right? Uh, and the, how you move through the world, and that's yeah. and once you start questioning that the sexual stuff, all the other shit just is like, oh wait, is this like does this and 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 making space for it to actually apply to you because what you're socialized to think may be actually what you think, but you have gotten there on your own, yeah. But also making space for other people's shit to not align with your shit and be okay with it. Be okay with it. Be okay with it. Um, because you're a sexologist and you look at the macro, so you look at the social structures. One question I, I, I'm going to ask, but I'm going to give a little bit of context to it, is what is the best way to learn about sex? And I ask that keeping two things in mind. Mm-hmm. Um, one, the faith community, right? And I think a lot of faith communities, you, you're smiling, you're smiling <laughs> because of this expectation that um, y- that you are supposed to uh, not have sex until marriage, that you're supposed to be a virgin until you're laughing, you're laughing. You want to let me finish the question? It's okay, so- I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go. <laughs> that you're not supposed to have sex or you're supposed to be celibate until um, marriage. And I think celibacy has its place, mm-hmm. but um, for certain people. Absolutely. Um, but, and then when you get into this relationship, boom, it's supposed to happen. So You're that's a city that, girl. That, You're a city girl. Listen. So that's one. That's that's context one. That's mm-hmm. one thing I want you to keep in mind when you answer this question. And the other thing you talked about it earlier that sexuality or sex is something that we learn over a lifetime. And so this is somewhat a touchy uh, topic I'm going to bring in here, but it's how. How do you give space to, and I'm specifically girls, because I think I, I, I think boys, tr- how we traditionally define boys, are given the space to explore their sexuality, but girls aren't, especially black girls. Um, boys are uh, uh, allowed to explore their sexuality if it's heterosexuality. Th- thank you. Yes, thank you. So, <laughs> so I, I, I put those, put those. So yes, I, I wanted to bring those two things in here. Um, and ask that question. So how do we learn about sex? Um, okay. <laughs> well, first and foremost, you start to learn about your body and your genitals and pleasure when you start potty training, if not before, because that's when you realize that this part of your body actually has a purpose. Oh, and if I touch it, it feels good to do this. So if I like children explore their bodies at that age. So, um, there's no one set time in life where you learn about sex as far as like sexual activity. Um, just like there's no one set time in your life where you learn about math or you learn about reading. You've been learning the ABCs since birth. You know what I'm saying? And then you get the ABCs and then you get the letters and you get the phonics and then you get the words and then you get the sentences, right? Just like sexuality education, you get the body parts, you get the autonomy, you get the functions, 
we're not talking about sex yet. We're just talking mm-hmm. about what they do, what the body parts do. Then you talk about healthy relationships and consent. Like you build on the skills as they are age appropriate in a line with how the body naturally develops hormonally. And I think with the faith-based community specifically, we do our children a disservice when we say abstinence until marriage, A, because most people are not doing that and have not done that, yet they expect it of their children. You're setting up an unrealistic expectation of if I'm fighting my biology on a daily basis to remain pure for my future partner, if I fall short to my my biological urges, somehow I'm falling short of the glory of God. We're, we're setting them up for failure in that way as well. Instead of saying there are, there's a pedestal that sex can sit on. And it's a pedestal that's held up by love, trust, and respect. And if you have love, trust, and respect, then, it's, then you have a healthy relationship foundation in which to explore your physical affection for someone. And, and and let me. I, I just want to. I just want to make sure people are hearing what I'm hearing. It's that you are very much expanding how we think about when we hear sex. How we think about that word mm-hmm. and what it all encompasses. Sex is a sexual activity. Is a physical expression of affection or attraction. Right. It should be. And we can operate in those spaces. We don't. We tell our kids to you know. Don't have sex until you get married. But then when they get married, we expect them to be able to keep their partners and be these sexual, you know, well, how, where they learn that shit from if they weren't doing nothing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so we're preparing. We're not preparing their children for success. My my definition of parenting is preparing your children to, for success, whatever that looks like for them. And I think that there is a space for celibacy. There is a space for abstinence. But I also think that it should be a conscious decision that's made by the person that's doing it, not from the pressure of if I succumb to this urge to be physical with this person that I care about, or even the person that I like a little bit, God ain't going to love me. My parents ain't going to love me. I'm a failure. That's too much pressure. That's too much pressure for children. Yeah, And I think that we shift the pressure to being, I want to find a happy, healthy, balanced dynamic that nourishes me as a person so that I want to express my affection for this person or people physically. <laughs> then I have the tools I need to be successful in that because people are getting married. I have loved someone I didn't trust before. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. We want to put set this sex as romantic love on a pedestal and those two things must exist at the same time. We are ill-equipping our daughters and we're ill-equipping our sons. But part of sex positivity is treating both of those genders the same. Yeah. My son can cook and clean and my daughter can use tools. You know what I'm saying? We have to we have to remove the gender from what we consider responsible adulthood. When I was dating dudes be like, "Well, can you cook?" How would you, how was you eating before I got here, bruh? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Your mama yeah. failed you. I don't know if you had a daddy or not, because that's the world we live in. But mm-hmm. I know you had a mama or a nana or a poppy or somebody, and they mm-hmm. fucking failed you. If you asking me, can I cook? Yeah. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? We want to make self-sufficient adults so that they are comfortable and confident in their, in their own personhood to connect with people and build relationships with people that nourish that in them. And then we ain't got to worry about who they fucking and how they fucking because we know that they have that happy, healthy, emotional space and they're making the best decisions for themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, I think that's what it should be about as opposed to who's fucking. And, and I think you're answering my next question because I, 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 I was going to say what keeps, um, and I'm, I'm specifying it, what keeps Black people in bondage when it comes to sex? But you're smiling because maybe you got something more, but I felt like you just answered my question. It's because mm-hmm. of how we understand it. It's mm-hmm. because our focus isn't necessarily on the whole healthy individual. It's not about trust. It's not about, um, you know, nurturing my soul, but it's mm-hmm. about like we focus solely on the, you know, you did, you did this earlier. Mm-hmm. We focus solely on, you know, like the 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 pleasure piece of it, and then we, we can talk about pleasure in a minute. But because yeah, it's not supposed to feel good. But what we tell our kids is, don't get no diseases, don't get no babies, and that's supposed to be the sex ed that they can go through the world and flourish with. 
And then you wonder why they are in relationships that are abusive when you or they are abusers their own fucking selves because yeah. we, we are all capable of abuse. Yeah. Because you don't even understand, you don't have the emotional intelligence to communicate and be healthy, happy in a, by yourself, let alone with a partner. We're yeah. setting our children up for failure, and in that and doing that, we are creating further generational curses. Yeah. 